story begins with Terah. And Terah was his uh, great grandfather. And Terah was uh, a chronicle to have been born in Africa. Um, the story is he made his way here through the Caribbean, like many African uh, uh, people. You know, um, the stories of African people coming to this country is it, it is not everybody just came directly here. A lot of individuals were um, enslaved on many of the islands and then eventually made themselves here and sold here. And I think all of you know, you know that Connecticut was big. See, we, we want to act like Connecticut was big. Connecticut and mid-Connecticut. So when we talk about um, uh, many of the, the rivers were used to transport um, African captives in Connecticut. And, and, and again, uh, a lot of it, whereas all, some, some, uh, many individuals who were involved in, in, in the captures of African people were many of our ministers. Our ministers were heavy. Connecticut ministers were heavy in owning people. Okay. Um, he married uh, Hagar, who was uh, an enslaved woman in the household of, again, Reverend uh, Richard Mansfield. They had. Um, Two chronicled children, but we know that Peril had more children than that. There's a lot of fractured pieces and so forth. Whether he married these other family life, we don't know. But but we do know that from his marriage to Hagar, two sons uh, were, were born, or two uh, sons were chronicled in record. And that is Laban. Laban's story is very interesting. We did a work, we did a presentation last year with the uh, Connecticut Freedom Trail about Laban. Laban's um, uh, grandson, um, William uh, uh, Laban, was um, one of the, the 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 builders of the uh, wharf, the New Haven Wharf, um, and a very um, uh, very uh, known uh, leader in New Haven and um, um, very well. And then Tobiah um, was the, the the grandfather of Ebenezer. And Tobiah um, um, married Rachel Hall. They both were uh, in the household of uh, Captain um, John Booster. They married around 1776. There's two problems about the two families because there's one saying that another minister married them, and there's one that a judge that does this whole pageantry of the family. Uh, when we look at um, Tobiah, Tobiah fought in the Revolutionary War, and again, he was emancipated from his service. And Evan Tobias is uh, Benizer's father. And again, I'm going to come back to this whole aspect of Bassett, because he was chronicled as Evan Tobiah, or, or Evan Tobias, for, for years. And then um, um, somewhere around the time that he went into Litchfield, um, and that's where Bassett was born. You know, uh, he comes back with the surname Bassett. Um, some say state, which I think is inaccurate through my research and the research of some of my colleagues, some connected the Bassett to his wife, um, stating that he took her surname. That's not correct. You know, um, um, the, 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 the Tobias or the Peril family, they resided on the lands of Bassett's. So he may have just taken the name, because many times people took the name because it's almost like the name had power of association. So a lot of African people may have taken um, their captor's name because it, it came with protection. It came with a lot of, 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 of um, um, what's the word? It came with a lot of recognition to take, take on that name. So he married Susan Gregory. And Susan Gregory um, is from the uh, Scatical tribe. She comes out of Kent. Her father was Peter. Gregory, um, the Gregories were kind of all kind of scattered all over the place, um, and my family links to the Gregories because the Gregories married into the Hecocks, the Hecocks married into the Phillips, and they are uh, all kind of circulating around in Milford. Um, they had three children: Charlotte, um, born in 1832; Ebenezer, born in 1833; and uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1836, here's these people coming out of enslavement, and they're naming these their children. And these very you have to have some, and these weren't educated people, or at least formally educated. All right. So what I've discovered in the research is, you know, um, Evan 
was he loved history. He, he loved he loved history, and I think he got that again because again, the household he's in, he's in a captain's household and stuff. And I think he just sucked up the history and lore. And I think between him and Susan, it was a fascination fascination with characters. Black governors was was a position that um, the white community allowed within the black community. It really was, see, you know, I think when people look at it, they look at it with the pageantry of it, but the whole institution of it really was an oppressive institution because it was a way of controlling that, again, we give you a little leadership, you keep everybody down, you keep everybody in place, and then we don't have to deal with you. But the people in Derby, they were out of the box with their black governors. It really, they took this little crumb and they made it work. And stuff. And so Bassett's father was a black governor. And again, it gave him some authority within the community. And um, Evan really used it. He used it to really motivate and encourage the community to empower the community. And it was a pageantry. It was really like like this picture is portraying that these people they 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 battled. That the men would one day get together and they would fight and who was the strongest and who was the most intellectual and who was this. And then you would gain that title. And so in 1840, um, um, his father. Also, his cousins as well. So there are other West, the Westons also was black governors, but there's family ties. Quash Freeman, all of these people, and these, many of these black leaders were once black governors in Germany. Ebenezer, um, again, what's different from the times is Ebenezer um, was educated. All right, so his father, you know, not even a generation removed from enslavement. So, so, so again, it's very clear that education was very important to these people. And I always say education costs. Anytime I talk about Ebenezer, I talk about education costs. Because if you think about it, here's a young man, an African-American young man, African-American, Native American young man, because it comes from that skeptical side. Also, I believe that Rachel was also Native American. I think the holes were also Native American as well. But um, why would they want him to go to school? Here's these people. His father's a laborer. Right? It's, not it's more profitable. It would have been more profitable for him to be out in the field or, or, or hiring himself off than sitting in a classroom. Think about it. That they committed to allowing him to sit in a classroom. Now, don't think about that in today's time, because we get it. We're like, yeah, that's an investment in the future. For African people, these people are still, the vast majority of people in the United States are still in chains. The vast, let me say that again, the vast majority of African people are still in captivity. This is, a, this is, this is, this is probably around, you know, 18, late 1830s. So they made a decision that, okay, Derby was a, a, another one of these interesting places where no matter your state in life, that's what one of Bass's quotes, no matter what color you are, no matter what gender you are, Derby educated its community. That's different. Remember, education was primarily for males, white males. But they opened it up. So, ed, so Bassett was able to get an early education, which began to create this trajectory for him. So the family began to step out of this space of being disfranchised from, from learning to being able to, to, to be um, in a space of learning. So he went to the Bir uh, Birmingham Academy. But one of the things that, you know, the Bassett story really shows is how significant the African community was. I already just started with the parents. The parents had to sacrifice. They had to sacrifice additional income. You know, but somebody else is able to help them, you know, to, to make it, because they weren't people of means. Right? They're living on somebody else's land, probably paying, you know, tent wages and so forth, working the land, killing themselves. Bassett continues his education at the prestigious Wesleyan Academy. <laughs> Wilbraham, Massachusetts. And this, this was a very progressive school because this school was really built on abolitionists. So Bassett was getting, you know, indoctrinated into this whole political cycle and leadership 
from day one. He's getting it from his father. Remember, I said he's a black governor. He's using that position. He's getting it from the community that say, hey, that education. He's getting it from his education. So when we look at this school and who graduated from this school, some of our great abolitionist leaders went to this institution. And here's Bassett at this institution. One of those great leaders is um, Henry Barnard. How many of you familiar with Henry Barnard? Henry Barnard, all right? So Henry Barnard is, we owe our current educational structure to Henry Barnard. He's the reformist. Before, teachers didn't even have to be, they didn't have to have a, a teacher's, what do they call it, a, a, going on their, their teacher's training. There was no formal teacher training. Anybody could be a teacher. Anybody could do it, whatever they wanted to do. And, and, and Henry Barnard created this whole structure of our modern educational system, right? He became the first Secretary of Education, right? And so this Connecticut person comes, he also comes out of the parent of this institution. So Bassett and Henry Barnard probably never knew that their lives would cross. All right, this New Britain, so Bassett is at uh, the Academy for about two years, and then Bassett um, is accepted at Central Connecticut State University, which was the state normal school. State normal school is the oldest uh, publicly operated institution in Connecticut. And Bassett was uh, um, accepted, but not only just being accepted, he was the first African American slash Native American person to ever uh, attend um, a publicly operated institution in Connecticut. We always talk about the Yale, some of you guys may be Yaleans, I don't know. But Yale would permit African Americans to attend classes, but they would not get a degree. And, and the same thing with Trinity and all these other older institutions, they were not permitting people of color to get a degree at all. And not only that, they were not permitting women. These were all male institutions, all male institutions. But this normal school not only elevated somebody like Bassett, creating, breaking down the color line, but it's, again, one of those first institutions that allow women to get a, a, an education, right? So again, Central Connecticut's uh, the State Normal School. Um, he enters the State Normal School in 1852 um, in his junior year and graduates in 1853 with honor. Loudly, the top of his class, he gave his valedictory speech, the true teacher, that was the title of his his speech is the true teacher. Um, Bassett was very much a part of the community. He joined uh, the first congregational church in Britain. We have that record because we have his departure from there when he graduated and he uh, moves to uh, New Haven. I'm still digging to find his life. What was his life like in New Britain? The community that he may have lived in, you know, the black community is long gone. And Bassett decided to continue his education, so he enters Yale and he takes uh, classes in advanced languages. Um, by the end of his career, Bassett was fluent in eight languages, including French. And he taught himself when he became um, the resident general or ambassador to Haiti. He taught him his own. He taught himself how to speak Creole as well. So he's a master at language, mathematics. The, the man was just a whiz, and so forth. And so, um, but again, he was denied the ability to get a degree. And it's ironic, some of his classmates, probably people who uh, remain in the program, probably a couple of years after he graduated, Yale graduated his first African American in stuff. So it, maybe if he stayed around, he might have been able to, to, to get that degree. Um, but again, he stays in New Haven, he becomes very involved in the uh, black sh uh, struggle um, for freedom and rights. Um, in New Haven, that's where he meets. Frederick Douglass, and they formed a friendship. All of these men were interconnected. So when I talk about the black community, it continued to follow and embrace Bassett because the Connecticut, there's a, a the convention of colored men, and even, the, and, 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 and I want to clarify, you know, it wasn't all men, this was a very unique organization. It was called the Convention of Colored Men, and it was this national organization of these black leaders who were all fighting for, for black suffrage and rights and opportunities. Um, and they were like the brokers, you know, they were the people. And Frederick Douglass was also part of this whole group. Um, and Bassett became a part of the circle. 
All of them follow the same trajectory. They're all around each other. Bassett, Bassett wasn't sitting there on a sideline. He was being mentored by these very powerful individuals. Faith Congregational Church in Hartford was like the hub of political stuff in Hartford. In um, um, Pennington was the minister there, so it was very likely Bassett knew him. Um, Beeman was also a minister at these churches. So again, all this stuff is really bringing Bassett into the fold. But once he gets to New Haven, he's really beginning to get a platform. He begins to start speaking. He gets to meet um, Frederick Douglass, and they begin to start organizing together and so forth. Around that same time, around 1855, he meets Liza um, Park. Her father worked at Yale, interesting enough, and he worked in one of the laboratories at Yale. New Haven was the hub of political uh, rights within Connecticut. That's where you went. That's what was, that was the place that happened. So Bassett being there, you know, and, and what's happened, you know, to Bassett after he leaves it, is really happening in New Haven. And Bassett continues to have this connection with New Haven. You know, Bassett has eight children with Eliza, probably about four of them reach adult, adulthood, um, but they were all well-educated people. When I talk about the, 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 the Convention for Colored Men, as I said, it was very inclusive of, of, of women being actively involved. All of Bass's female children became very highly educated and became independent on their own. Never married. Actually, none of his children. This is uh, Ebenezer Bass Jr. He graduated Yale, so his father was denied a degree, but you know what? Payback, his, his son did his degree. And this is his daughter, Charlotte, probably named in honor of his, um, his aunt. And she also became a highly esteemed educator at uh, the Institute for Colored Children in uh, Philadelphia, which is also um, the oldest historically black institution in the nation. And this is his son, Ulysses uh, Simpson Grant, again, named after. <laughs> All right, and there's a reason for that. I'll get to that in a second. And again, another payback. You didn't give me a degree, but you gave my older son a degree, but you're going to give my younger son a degree. And so um, Ulysses gets his degree in 1895, and he became a teacher and so forth. And so again, as I said, Bassett becomes involved heavily in this whole abolitionist rights movement. So um, in, 18, in 1869, Ulysses S. Grant, under the pressure of who? All of these black leaders. <laughs> Uh, was pressured that the uh, a position came opening for the minister resident, which is the equivalent of an ambassador today, for Haiti. Now Haiti, remember about 1801, Haiti you know, fought for its independence, the first uh, independent uh, democracy in, the, in, in, in this part of the hemisphere. And those, um, so it was just Year after year, there was civil war and strife. So they were looking for somebody to replace the outgoing minister resident. And there was pressure from the black community that this individual should be a person of color. Um, you know, and, um, and a part of that uh, was Bassett himself. And Bassett wrote a letter, a formal letter, to uh, President Grant and stating that he believed that he was the best person to go there. Um, but now on, on top of that, he had a lot of support. So when I talked about the, the, the Convention of Colored Men, and other groups, they all rallied behind Bassett. Not Frederick Douglass. It was almost a unanimous vote within our, in our Congress um, to um, support Ebenezer. So doing so, he became the first uh, African American slash Native American to become uh, a US diplomat. He was appointed to the island of Hispaniola. He served two different functions. One was this ambassadorship to Haiti, but also had an oversight over the Dominican Republic as well. You know, so a lot of times we, people write just about Haiti, but uh, his position was to oversee the, the entire island. Um, the interesting thing about Bassett and his story there, just to be just quick with it, um, Bassett wasn't a pushover. The American government at the time wanted to take over the island. You know, remember, right now we can just go get sugar at any point. But Haiti was the hub of the sugar trade, right? And the government felt that it was a strategic place to be. Um, 
they could profit from this island, so they wanted to move in and take it over. And Bassett was like, no, you're not going to do that. Well, you work for the government. So he was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And um, so there was, in record, you can see this, this cat and mouse game with it. But Bassett understood what that democracy meant to those people. And he was willing to put his neck on the line. So before there was Condoleezza Rice and uh, uh, Colin Powell or President Obama, there was Bassett. First. The first.